Okay, so anything about this, the question I posed to you before the break? Now we're having multiple test queries. It's easy to do. Is there anything you have to be aware of if you do that? If you, in terms of times, you have multiple test session, test queries, and others in between, they all have the same bit, by the way. So the question is, uh, can you do a hybrid argument? And since everyone has the crypto knowledge, I assume you know what this is, which would mean I give you the real key. I'm just picking one at random again. Let's say this one. I'm giving you the real key. If you make a test query, and I can do that by just make a reveal query. And then I have this one test station where I either get the, the true key or the false key. And from then on, I'm going to give you just random answers. Right, this would be the common hybrid argument. You pick one at random. Before that session, you give me the real keys by making reveal queries. So you get the key and then you hand it forward. And then afterwards, you make you just give random answers. And now the hybrid argument says if, if this one single test query which is left gives you the real key or random, you can't distinguish that. Yeah, it doesn't work quite the way you would expect it to work. Does anyone of you see why? <coughs> so this, if this would work, right, you have reduced the case of multiple test queries to one to a single test query. And basically, yeah, I can from now on work with single test queries. It makes my life much easier. And I lose a factor of number of test queries in the security bound. Okay. But it doesn't work, at least not the way it is defined here. I mean, in the testing element example you gave, you had to guess uh, which one is going to be the test. So now if you have like n tests, you have to <coughs> make a guess that's only the case of it's going to be a. Uh, no, it's, it's polynomial. But you're right, right? This is the, the loss in the security. If I have n test sessions. But I just have to guess, in this hybrid argument, I just have to guess a single one, right? This will be my point where I switch from real keys to random keys through that single test query. And I can, I can guess this is probably 1 over n if I have n test queries. And the number of executions, because the adversary is polynomial bounded overall is you know, bounded by some decent value. In these here? Yes. Um, why? OK, so, so my goal is to give you the real key. So when you make a test, whoops, disappeared. Where am I? There. OK, so if you make a test query to some identity here, right? I'm not going to do a test query. I'm going to make a reveal query. So this gives me the key, so I'm going to give you the key. Works perfectly. Yeah, right? This always gets the uh, output the correct key, but if uh, the adversary asks the test query, he wants to for one half get a random. Right, but this is part of the hybrid argument, right? The hybrid, OK, so, so basically you have the distinction between you have test returning a random string, Next test retu returning also a random string. Next test also random versus test always giving you the key. Test giving you the key and test giving you the key. All right? And of course, this is two, three. Okay? And the hybrid argument says you, you basically shift step by step, right? So you're going to say, okay, I'm going to remove this and instead give you the key. All right, then I'm going to do the same with this one. And now I do the hybrid like this. Right? And this is just written here. But I exchange keys and random values. Right? First I give you keys, then there's one session, and then I from then on I give you random answers. Th this form of hybrid argument is sound. 
But there's one catch related to the key exchange property, which doesn't work. I mean, this is, this is how you would, for example, do it for encryption. Dependent chain in what sense? Yeah, I'm not sure. It seems to you seem to be on the right path. I'm not sure if you're y there yet. Uh huh. The partners would have the same key, right? If you think about that, this test session here, this test session here, is partner to this test session here. Now, in the hybrid argument, I would give you the real key here and the random key here. If you do the test either, if you, if you do the test properly, you would get, of course, the same key, or ideally, you would get the same key because this, the executions belong together, so they must have the same key. Now, in terms of your test oracle, this also needs to take care of these things, right? If you test partners, then the test oracle cannot send, oh, and now I'm going to give you a next random, fresh random key. It needs to check, hey, this session is partnered to a session I have I've been tested on previously. And then I need to give you the same answer, of course, because it needs to be consistent. And, and this is exactly the problem. How do you make sure that you know consistency, right? How do you know which sessions are partnered? And this is possible if you have basically what I call public SIDs, right? If you know the session identifiers, right, just by looking at the transcript, you know, hey, they are partnered. Now I need, as a test oracle, I need to give you the consistent answer. And if you know this as a test oracle, you can also, as a the person playing against the single test query do it in the hybrid argument. Now I have an ongoing discussion with one of my colleagues with whom I've written a couple of papers about key exchange. Um, and he likes to say, let's make life easy. Let's just say session identifier is the key. Clever if you think about it, right? No three parties will have the same key, otherwise I can break it, so no three session identifiers will collide. If session identifiers are identi identical, the keys are identical, by definition. In this case, they are secret. That's what I mean, they're not public. And then you run into the trouble of, if you want to mount this hybrid argument, you have no idea if this session here is partner to that session. And that gives you a headache if you want to prove it to be reducible from the multi-test session case to the single test session case. Again, if you have public session identifiers, which most of the people have because they just say it's part of the transcript, and you can say, okay, I know this session belongs to that session, then the two are equivalent. If you don't, I have no idea. I wouldn't know how to prove it. Further issues? Is that a question or a question. an open question? Um, we know about the other no, I mean not according to the model. Again, the, according to the model, it's fine, right? Session IDs, same session ID, same key, everything is fine. But this, <coughs> the thing that you have multiple test queries or a single one, I don't know how you would do that with this. Ah, okay. Okay. No. There may be other problems. I don't know. Uh, again, I'm in favor of having session identifiers, big parts of the transcript. Question. Doesn't change anything, right? Uh, no, because, but what is your key then? Your key is still your key or your key is also the hash? What is the session no, key? I mean, you said there is a problem. If SID is equal to the key, then you cannot make it public. Yeah. I wonder if, if instead you define it to be some cryptographic hash value of the key. Yeah. Would it be possible now to, to publish the SID? 
Um, but who would publish these? I mean, the session identifiers is something which only the crypto people look into for the analysis, right? So no one's going to publish the session identifiers. And the question is, if... if, if The problem is that I cannot, me as an outsider, I cannot tell just by looking at the transcripts that, oh, this session belongs to that session, <coughs> right? And this doesn't go away here, I don't think so. What was the problem? So if the session, so the problem is that if I run the hybrid argument, right, and it's like this. Okay, and I'm going to simulate the first, I'm going to give you always the real key by making reveal queries to the session, and then I know the key and I can hand it to you. And from here on, I will just give you random answers. This is easy. Now the problem is that what if, let's say this session and this session here are partnered? then as an adversary, you would expect um, to have a consistent answer. Now, I can do that if I know that these are partnered. I can know that if, uh, if the session identifiers are public, because then I can just check, oh, transcript, okay, this, these two sessions must belong together, so I'm going to give you the same answer here, instead of different ones. And if the session identifiers are not public, I wouldn't know how to do it. No, when it's public, there's no problem. Oh. When it's secret, there's the problem. <laughs> That's the point. Is there some reason why you want to make session identifier secret? There are, there are cases where, for example, if, if you think about, and we get to see that and talk about TLS, think about that you have some intermediate key and from then on, you switch on encryption in the key exchange already, right? This is protected by some keys, which me, as an outsider, I don't have. So I can't see what message is sent here, right? So I cannot really specify, oh, session identifiers is this, is this, and then there's G to the X, G to the Y, because I don't see it anymore. We did this in our TLS analysis and it gave us some headache to run the hybrid argument. It works there, but it's specific to that TLS protocol. Does it, does it give you an advantage? Well, if you, if you just set session identifiers to be key, right, it's really easy to see that um, you don't have to prove anything about same session identifiers means same key, for example, right? It's obvious. In terms of uh, anything beyond that, I wouldn't know. Yeah. Say it again, would it? Stronger security models. I mean, especially if you talk about uh, David and password authenticated key exchanges, it, it makes a difference, right? <laughs> okay, um, I got a few questions in the during the break. Maybe I should quickly. Look at them. Oh, so here, um, my notation is a little bit ambiguous. It's understood that, that this here, this doesn't mean that the adversary first does the send and then does the test and then does the reveal and then does the corrupt, right? You can interchange those steps arbitrarily, okay? So it's not meant to be uh, time is, is flowing from top to down when it comes to the communication with the oracles, right? You can do a send and then a test and then a reveal and then a corrupt and then a send again and so on. And the second thing was, um, someone asked me, I understand that 
if I talk about sessions which you test, these are completed sessions, right? You cannot test a session which hasn't derived the key yet. So it's really the session is over, it has a key, I can attach a session identifier to it, and then you can test it. Okay, so again, I changed the... Um, Reconnect the power. Okay, so I changed the order in the program you find. Now we talk about uh, forward secrecy, but I want to dive into protocols and TLS um, at this point. Okay, um, this is about TLS 1.3, so we'll look at the latest version of TLS or soon to be uh, version of TL TLS. Um, but also to other protocols, and since I got some questions in the break during the break about hey, how does this work with you know security and UKS attacks and so on, we'll also also dive into that, how they fit into the model and how they don't. <laughs> okay, but we start with um, TLS 1.3. Um, I'm going not going to talk about TLS 1.2 at all. I think Kenny covers a lot of these things on the last day. Okay, um, TLS 1.3, so this is the story about SSL and TLS. Um, SSL 1.0 was never published. Uh, I think the reason was it was designed so badly um, that they didn't even use it. And then SSL 2.0 was published by a company called Netscape. So Netscape was like Chrome in the 90s, right? It was the the browser which everyone used, it was more or less the only browser back then. Uh, I think Netscape, meanwhile, probably bought or doesn't exist anymore. Okay, and the search engine was called Alta Vista, not Google. That was about uh, the time. Okay, so in 1996, they had SSL 3.0. Um, they dropped 2.0 because it had security problems. And then in 1999, they adopted it to make it um, a non-proprietary branch. So before it was owned and run by Netscape, and then um, I think the ITF took over and said, okay, we need to adopt this protocol and design our TLS, so they also renamed it. Um, you can think that TLS 1.0 is roughly the same as SSL 3.1. I think some people would actually say they are equivalent, TLS 1.0 and 3.0. I'm not going into the details there. Okay, so TLS 1.0 lasted for 70 years, then we had 1.1, um, small improvements, new algorithms included, and so on. TLS 1.2 existed since two 2008, um, and now we're in the process of getting TLS 1.3. And I put 2018 with a question mark because I think it was supposed to be finished in 2017. And it's still going on, but hopefully it will be ready soon. And um, 1.3 has a complete makeover. I mean, it's, it's rather a 2.0 than a 1.3 because it changed a lot of things in the, in the design of the protocols. So here you see the, uh, the uh, draft, the history of the drafts of 1.3. So it started in April 2014, and you had a couple of drafts. Um, there were a few especially draft five was interesting because there were like two proposals of protocols. One was uh, Hugo's protocol and one was the protocol developed earlier. And at, at this point it wasn't actually clear which protocol it would be in the end. And then somehow merged the two things together from then on. Um, most of the crypto design then was fixed maybe with version 12 or 18. Um, they had some minor changes, and the, the delay, the recent delay, is just due to the fact that apparently a lot of clients cannot work with TLS 1.3 at this point. So it's not about security, it's just about that some firewall detects some TLS 1.3 message and says, I'm going to drop that. And this means that the traffic is disconnected and you don't want to have this, and they're working on this. Um, so we're currently, at least last week, we were at version 23, um, I 
let's say this will hopefully also the, be the last version, and then we will have TLS 1.3. Okay, so this is, okay, TLS 1.3 is, because it's a versatile protocol which can be used in multiple settings, it has a lot of options. I cannot give you all of these options. Um, I'll walk you through some of the main protocols, main steps, and we also look into why they are secure. Okay, so this is the overall overview how the protocol looks like. So you start the protocol sending some client hello, saying just say I want to talk to you. And you also start sending some key share. This is crypto material. And I'll have the details on the next slide. Then the server responds saying, yes, I'm willing to talk to you, and here's my cryptographic contribution. And then the server also sends a configuration. This may be some data. Touch on that later. A certificate, but this is optional. right? If you do the unauthenticated version, then it wouldn't send, or it, it doesn't need to send the certificate. And uh, what's called a server certificate verifier, which is a signature. And then there's a finished message, which is basically a MAC over the communication data. And then the client, if you want to have mutual authentication, can also provide a certificate and a signature and send its finished message. And then the two parties can derive the channel key. Let's see overall structure. Now, something interesting in TLS 1.3 is that they immediately derive a so-called handshake key. Okay, if you see, you have provided your crypto input here and some crypto input here. Think of this as g to the x and g to the y. You are able to also already compute a key, right? And they do this, and then they encrypt the information from there on. Okay, so this is why I use this curly bracket notation here for these messages. Any idea why they want to do this? Privacy? In what sense? In what sense? Okay. Privacy. Privacy. Was already said. Yes. That, for example, you protect the uh, certificates, so you keep uh, the the information about who is sending something um, private, encrypted. But um, it's clear that at this point, you see, there's no kind of authentication here, right? I sent a certificate, my name even later, and the signature. So this is really an anonymous uh, key exchange, right? It just keeps out the eavesdropper, the passive eavesdropper at this point. Think about if you're an agency and you store all the communication on the web in some desert in Utah, then you just have encrypted information. Okay, so here are the crypto details. The client hello has a lot of information in there, um, but essentially from a cryptographic point of view, it's just a nonce, 256 bits. The client key share is just a G to the X, it's running in Diffie-Hellman protocol, and then server responds with its, own, with its own nonce and also with its G to the Y. And now you can see it can already at this point compute a key because now it has an anonymous uh, Diffie-Hellman here. So it can derive a key. The key is, the process is really, really complex, but the key is essentially using this Diffie-Hellman value and the transcript so far to derive the key. So I'm skipping server configuration for the moment. Server certificate is just your public key and your certificate. Maybe it's the public key is embedded in the certificate and then you sign the transcript so far. And the finished message is essentially a MAC, from a cryptographic point of view, is a MAC about the transcript. Now the MAC key, we've seen the in the first lecture, we've seen this example of if you use a key um, to MAC, for example, in the key exchange, we get into trouble with the BR protocol. This is a key which is derived from the handshake key making it somewhat independent, right? So the problem doesn't occur that I use the actual session key. And now let's say the client may or may not answer here, provide a certificate, it certainly sends its Mac over here. And then they compute the challenge key, and again, this is a really complex key derivation, 
but I'm skipping over the details here. Okay, so this is now, um, let's briefly talk about the keys, because I mentioned this, that you shouldn't use keys in the key exchange. So what they do is, um, the general key is also called master secret in TLS, and the handshake keys actually use to derive several sub-keys. So for example, you have the client handshake traffic key. So this is the key which the client uses to encrypt its data. You have the server handshake traffic key. This is used here to for encryption. We have the client Mac key. This is used here to compute this Mac. The server Mac key, which is which is used here. Right. So it's keys derived from the Diffie-Hellman. Right. It's like not using the key, but you have your you have your Diffie-Hellman key, and then you apply the handshake keys, and then you apply. Um, the same key again to some other material to get the master secret. So if you do it like this, and TLS does that, then you can use the keys used for the from or the derived from the handshake key. Because they are revealing this key or using this key does not mean that you reveal this key. Okay, and then the master secret also um, has several sub-keys. One is the exporter master secret, so TLS allows uh, some keying material to be passed on to uh, applications. So you don't, as an application, you don't need to care about good randomness. You can basically use the TLS design and say, okay, I want to export that um, master secret. You have a resumption master secret. This is if you reconnect to the server, then there's a faster protocol. Um, and we have the client application traffic key, which is then used for example, to encrypt or secure the data which is subsequently sent, and the same on the server side. Okay, this this is the diffie hellman variant. There's also a pre-shared key variant, PSK, which basically says if you already share a key, so this can either be um, from the previous connection, so you have the resumption master secret, or you can think about this if you type in passwords, right? If you connect to your wireless router, you would just type in the password, which is printed on the router. You can also use that. What about the gene, the modulo is the far tip of the hammer? Say it again, what's it about? The tip of the DPM and the modulo value is the far tip of the hammer. They specify which curves, which curves you can use, yeah. So it's not, uh, it's not freely chosen chosen by the parties. So there is restriction of specific numbers? I think they have specific curves in there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm skipping over these details because I'm looking at the crypto part, right? There's a, there's a hello message and you start negotiating what curves you, m you may want to support and not, and so on. That's all in there, but... Uh, Let's say all the curves which are in there are good. Okay. And there is no issue of privacy and also go deeper. Because it's actually giving information about the client, what you want, what they can't, it might be you look at the signature. Oh, there's no no worry about the privacy about the negotiation, but at some point you have to start, right? You have to say, okay, I want to talk to you and I'm able to talk this language. Uh, you cannot protect this at this point, right? If you have the values fixed, yeah. But this also means that um, you may run into trouble because a client may not be able to support strong crypto, uh, I don't know, 512 bits elliptic curve crypto because it's too power consuming or whatever. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of the issues, right, we had with TLS 1.2. A lot of options causing a lot of possibility for attacks. They reduce this, but they cannot get rid of this entirely. Okay, this is the pre-shared key, pre key variant. Um, so you already have some shared information, some key with the uh, between server and client. And now you start sending a client hello again, saying I want to talk to you again. You can include Again, a Diffie-Hellman value, if you like, but you don't have to. Early data will come to this later. And then I'm just going to tell you, this is of course not, I'm not going to send the key in clear. This is just some identifier for, okay, and please use that key, of course. 
And then the server answers accordingly. Um, and from then on, you can basically connect securely, right? You can compute the key. OK, these are the two main variants. Um, again, I'm not talking about resumption and so on. What I would like to do is now walk you through the case of Diffie-Hellman and why it's secure. And I'll only talk about unilateral authenticated case, right? The common case for TLS, right? Those the client doesn't have a certificate, so the server at the end has no idea to whom it's talking to, but the client says, okay, I'm talking to this server or the holder or the, the owner of that public key in the certificate. Okay, so here you see the protocol condensed to the minimal amount. I'm neglecting here the fact that you already have a key and that this communication is uh, encrypted from here on. I'm not going to do that. Let's just uh, suppose it's sent in clear. In our analysis, of course, we looked into this, that uh, this may be encrypted, but then you have to switch to what we call a multi-stage key exchange protocol where you derive several keys throughout the execution. I'm going to just assume that it's sent in clear. Actually, it's not clear that... Um, so this, if, if I do this, if I would do this in the full analysis, this would not tell me a lot about the actual security of the protocol, but again, we have done this properly, but I'm not going to talk about this here. And I'm going to simplify the analysis a little bit um, so we can basically talk about DDH and not some fancy DDH assumption. Okay, so this is now the protocol with the, um, I'm also ignoring the max. So this is now the core protocol of TLS and the crypto components we are looking at, right? You send a nonce, G to the X, server responds with the nonce and G to the Y, and then sends its certificate and the signature over the transcript. That's basically the, the core part of this Diffie-Hellman protocol. Now, as the session identifier, I just put down all the information except for the signature. This is what's also not used in the key derivation in TLS. Um, basically, the signature is a mean to authenticate the transcript, but it not, should not be part of the transcript. This is why I excluded in the session, excluded in the session identifiers. Okay, so if you want to prove that to be secure according to BR, there's um, turned out there's a nice strategy to divide the cases how the adversary can attack the protocol. Um, one is the adversary tests the client session on this side without a partner. Or you can consider the case that the adversary tests the server session, which doesn't have a partner, or it tests the session on either side, but then the session has an honest partner. And this covers all the important cases for BR security, right? Okay, so let's look at the first case. Let's look at the protocol and let's say the adversary tests this session on the client side. We have one test session, let's say we can predict, we can guess it in advance, okay? And let's assume this client doesn't have a partner, right? So there's no server which has the same session identifier which matches to the client's view. Okay, so basically this goes away, there's no partner. Okay, so we don't have a partner in this session. And now if you look at what's happening here in the session, you send a signature over the key in the um, certificate, right? So if there's no partner, if there's no, There's no partner session. This means that this signature has not been created by a server, by an honest server. Right? If there was a partner, then of course this partner would have signed this message, but there is no such thing as a partner session. And um, the, the partnering is defined over the entire transcript except for the signature. Right? If you had someone, then you had a partner. If you had someone, some honest server signing this message, you had a partner. But we assume you don't have a partner. Now in the BR model, we have this thing that if the 
If the intended partner is authenticated, like here, right, it cannot be corrupt. This is to exclude the trivial case that uh, I'm talking to a corrupt party and of course the corrupt party knows the key and can test me and shouldn't be allowed to test me on my session. Okay, so this is from BR, basically, um, one of the requirements. And this means no one has signed this, the server is not corrupt, so there's a valid signature under the server's key and the, the server has not been compromised. A valid creating a valid signature under someone's key is a forgery. Right? So this means, if you assume that the signature scheme is secure, and that's what we do, this case cannot happen. There can't be such a session unless you were able to forge signatures. Good. No such thing. You cannot even test it. So let's look at the case that the, ser that the test session is on the server side. Okay? So now we're testing this. There's no partner. This is the assumption. So what about security now? Irrelevant. Why? I cannot test this. Why? BR somewhere. BR somewhere. Exactly. Um, active security. There you are. Here's the condition. If you have an unauthenticated partner, right, server session TLS, there's an unauthenticated partner in this test session, there must be an honest partner, un otherwise I'm not allowed to test it. Right? If you accept that the model makes sense, because you say, well, if, if I have an unauthenticated partner, it may be a corrupt partner, so it knows the key, then we are good. We don't have to actually deal with that case at all. It's simply not allowed to test such a server session. Out. Final case, you test either on the client or on the server side. But there's definitely a partner session. So this means if there's a partner session, especially these messages have been chosen by honest parties and sent by them, exchanged by them. But then the adversary's task is to compute the Diffie-Hellman value from that. He gets to see g to the x, g to the y, chosen by honest parties, and basically in order to distinguish, he needs to compute the Diffie-Hellman key. But he can't compute g to the x, y, right? So this cannot happen either, or um, at least you can test it and you're not able to distinguish it from random. That's basically it. That's why TLS 1.3 is secure according to BR. Unilaterally authenticated Diffie-Hellman version. So in our work we also looked into the other cases and mutual authenticated anonymous, PSK and so on. But I'm going to skip over them. I'm not going to talk about them. Yeah. No, active adversary. Man in the middle attack in the sense that the adversary just passes the, the messages on? No, he, he actually uh, produces a GTX stack and a GTX stack and then so, so the adversary is sitting here receiving this G to the Y and then, okay, so the adversary is sitting here and now sending its own nonce and its own G to the Y? But it's covered, right? Because then um, this guy in the session transcript now has the server or the adversarial parameters here. And this guy here has RC, G to the X, RS, G to the Y, and so on. So they're not partnered anymore. Right? And this is covered because if you don't partner, then you have to, to basically on this side, on the, on the adversary side, you see you ha would have to send a signature. Let's say you want to impersonate the server. You would have to send a signature about values Right? The signature is about these values. Where now you have changed the values. And that would mean you need to forge signatures. Like 
you think there are security problems? <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> Maybe you should let the ITF know immediately. Coming back to the unknown key share attacks, and I think I have them right now up, and then we, we can discuss this again. Um, okay, so so I'll, re I'll, I'll go back to the identity misbinding, unknown key share attacks, um, and especially how they relate to the current model we have. And you'll see that the model per se does not cover them. Okay, so let, let's dive into this and go back a little bit. So let's, let's see, let's say we have an anonymous um, Diffie Hellman and the common way to make sure that it's secure against active addresses is just to sign the transcript. Okay, so we can do that and then we also send our certificate, it's so including the public key and then the, uh, the other side can check that this is secure. And this is a common way how you design key exchange protocols. You have an unauthenticated key exchange, and then you do the authentication of the data afterwards. Okay, so what about key secrecy? Is this key secret? Does it provide key indistinguishability? It does. Let's assume that we again test the session on the server side, and it's pretty close to the TLS proof, right? Um, this means if I test the session in the BR model, the partner must not be corrupt, otherwise I'm not going to give any guarantees about the key, right? So it must be an honest partner, and this again means that if I receive this message here, it can only have been created by C for a chosen G2X and a G2Y given by me as a server. And then again, the, the whole thing applies. If it's uh, honestly chosen G to the X and G to the Y, the adversary cannot compute the key. And then roughly the idea is again that the test session is secure. Okay, so you can prove this protocol as secure as well. So let's go back to the unknown key share attacks. Okay, here's how the attack works. Um, you get from the server, so you let the first two messages just pass. You don't change anything there. And then you get from the server the, the signed transcript and the certificate. And you're going to replace this by your own identity as an adversary, and you're going to sign this anew under your key. And then you let the, uh, the reply of the client go through again. That's the unknown key share attack. Because if you look at it, um, then they, if they apply the key derivation function to, let's say, the transcript uh, of the, un the unauthenticated key exchange and the Diffie-Hellman value, they, of course, derive the same key on both sides, right? Because this is identical in both cases. However, the, uh, the, the essence of this unknown key share attack was that this guy believes to share a key with Eve, right? Because it gets the certificate of Eve, so it's going to say, yeah, I'm talking to Eve. And this guy gets a certificate of the client so it believes to talk to the client and have a key with it. And Hugo mentioned that this can have some devastating effects, right? If you now just send something encrypted under the key, and if you receive something, you assume, yeah, it's an authenticated key, so I can assume it really comes from that party. In fact, it does not. So this means, I've just shown you, I give you a brief outline that the, this protocol is BR secure, and there's the UKS attack. How can this be? There's only, well, there are two conclusions. I made a mistake <laughs> and was able to, <laughs> to convince you. Or the other one is? Yeah, exactly. The model doesn't capture those. And we talk about plain BR security, right? The way I defined it. If you recall, I gave you the, the informal interpretation of what authenticated key exchange provides you, right? They're saying at most one other party holds the key, and if you talk about authentication on one side or both sides, then the intended party is really that party holding the key. So let's look how this fits into UKS attacks. 
So the client believes to share a key with Eve. Oh, sorry, maybe I should start with the easier case. So the server believes to share a key with the, the client. Now, from the server's perspective, there's at most one other party holding the key. Right? The adversary in this unknown key share tag has no clue about the key. Yeah, there is one other party, at most one other party, holding the key. Fine. Okay, and for the client, um, it's also true, right? There's at most one other party, namely the server, holding the key. And here the question is now I, I identify a different intended partner, right? Because I say I'm talking to Eve. But this is fine, right? Because the, this assumption here just says if you have authentication and the intended partner is honest, then this party is the one holding the key. But this here is not given anymore. The intended partner, Eve, is corrupt. It's the adversary. That's why there's no contradiction to the security model. Now, what is important for you to take home is that BR security gives you basic security about the key, less so about the identities of partners. Okay? Let's say you can easily, you can ask the text, you can easily um, add. We're saying if you have the same session identifiers, um, then you, you point to the, to the right partner. Um, you can do that. It's not too much work, actually. But again, if you want to have this, you need to look carefully. If you just do BR security, you're not basically not covering this. Because BR security, in its basic sense, just tells you this here, right? Something about the session key. Something is good about the session key. Not about, hey, I'm talking to the right person. This is the big difference. OK, so what do you do against UKS attacks? And trust me, I'm going to tell you in a second that TLS 1.3 is probably not susceptible to UKS attacks. Um, there are two things you can do if you want to avoid them. The first one is you bind the uh, partner identity into the authentication step. This is what Hugo proposed yesterday. And the other thing is you bind the identity into the key derivation. I'm not saying that one of them works exclusively, or maybe you have to use a mixture of both, but these are the typical things you would do as a kind of general countermeasures against UKS attacks. So binding the partner identity is you include the identity in the signature scheme, or you can do max, right? You derive the key and then you mac over the identity. Then it should only be the, this partner can compute the MAC. And this is done in um, who had the ISO protocol, IKE version 2, and also TLS 1.3. The second, second thing is you include the partner identity in the key derivation. So if you think about it in terms of the previous attack, um, if you would have your identities here, right, maybe the certificate as well, and as well here, you would have C and certificate C then they would derive different keys. I'm not saying they're entirely independent, but they would be different, right? Okay, and this is, to, this is what TLS also does, right? TLS uses a mixture of both. Yeah. You, you're saying that you want to have more than just saying, oh, I know at most one other party knows the key. Yeah. Yeah, but th that's, that's about entity authentication, right? <coughs> the basic BR security about authenticated key exchange. I understand what BR gives you, I understand. Yeah. But in a mutual authentication, like in TLS, if I finish the handshake successfully, I don't want to know the other part, that there is not a party who's going to the other party also. Good. <laughs> so I, I think I, I cannot give you a general solution to the problem. I, I just think you have to take home 
the fact that BR security talks about something, something about the key, the freshness of the key, not so much about entity authentication. Yeah, um, but again, it, so for example, for TLS, it's quite easy to capture those things, saying if you have the same session IDs, you really point to the same partner, and we did this for TLS 1.3 as well. Um. In TLS. in TLS, yeah, so because it doesn't know the client. Right, right. So, uh, so the, the left side uh, doesn't work in, in TLS. It, it yeah. must go to the, it's because you wrote, you did have a signature or via the mask. The yeah, it's not either or, it's, it, you can combine ro both, right, like in Sigma. Uh, Yeah, which we'll get to TLS and, and, and see how it's done there. Okay. Okay, here's um, again the ISO protocol, and now you see that this time you include the identity of the, your intended partner there. And now, if you want to mount the attack, the UKS attack, and you've seen this yesterday, then what's happening if I want to, you know, sign this under my key, that's fine, but then I get the reply that um, the client, yes, I would like to talk to Eve, and then you would have to forge a signature here. This is why the protocol is not set, um, attacked, can be attacked by these UKS attacks. Okay, so let's look at TLS 1.3 and UKS resistance. Um, so this is again the protocol, and there, one thing is there is a MAC computed over the derived key, Right, so only the the party knowing the key should be able to provide that MAC. That's one of the things. And then you also have the user identities and the key derivation, right? Because the key derivation is about everything up to the client finished message, including the certificates. So if you have authentication, you put them in the <coughs> key derivation, and then any change to the identities would mean you derive different keys. And again, we we had a model which captures UKS attacks on top of BR for analyzing TLS 1.3. Okay, let's look at the other um, attack, the other well-known attack. It's key compromise impersonation uh, security, KCI attacks. And the attack works as follow. I'm, I'm going to attack the client, right, pretending to be a server, on a server. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to corrupt the long-term key of the client. Sounds weird because I want to basically test or attack that session and I'm going to corrupt it. And then I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I know the client secret key to impersonate as the server. Such cases have been reported um, actually on TLS 1.2 or one, one sub protocol with static keys. So they didn't really corrupt, it's not like they corrupted the client and got the secret key, but what they did is they forced clients basically to use a certain certified key 
and this was static Diffie Hellman, so they knew the um, value x in the key. So here's the attack. Again, it's static, so you just exchange the g to the x, which is included in a certificate, and then you change the g to the y, which is also included in the certificate, and you also exchange nonces. And then you derive the keys by applying the Diffie Hellman value to the nonces, and then you authenticate by mapping the communication under independent keys, one for the client, one for the server, and they don't interfere with the session keys. So the, the problems of using the key in the protocol does goes away because we're using different keys for the authentication here. Now if you look at this protocol and you think about that, um, so this is the long-term secret is basically the X. If you can corrupt this, or as in the attack, you can basically force the client to use your static key, then I can compute the secret key from the server's public key. Okay, once I have your secret key, the server's public key, I can also complete this authentication step. Right? I have these keys at this point already, so yes, I can just compute a Mac myself. So meaning this authentication is void if I have one part of the key. And that was the attack they, they ran on TLS 1.2 with static Diffie-Hellman. Tells you again, static keys are worrisome. How much time do I have? It's lunchtime. it's lunchtime now. Oh. I don't think I <laughs> <laughs> I think I have a few more slides. Okay, let's see. It's five more minutes. So okay. Okay, let's look at um, key compromise imperson impersonation resistance in TLS. And again, we haven't included this in our analysis, but I would be very, very surprised if you can attack TLS 1.3 by this attack. And the reason is that um, if you know the clients, right, you corrupt, you want to attack this session, and you get a hold of the secret key of this client. Now, the secret key of the client in TLS 1.3 is a signature key. So you know your, I know your secret key, and I'm going to attack you. This doesn't help me in producing... Um, Uh, this doesn't help me, oh, okay, I thought this should be go down here, but actually, yes. Um, this shouldn't help me in producing and uh, forging a signature under the server key, right? The server has an independent signature key. So, yes, I can know your secret key, but I still would need to forge a signature under the server's key. So, intuitively, this shouldn't help me. Okay, and uh, maybe it's a good point in time to stop here. Let me just, for the break, think about it. I've just told you that UKS attacks are usually not covered in BR. It's not hard to uh, augment the model to cover that. Think about why KCI attacks are not covered by BR secrecy. So this is basically your task over lunch. And now we go on a break. <laughs> <laughs>